Theories abound regarding the construction of the Great Pyramid. As yet, no link between pyramid construction and hieroglyphic symbols has been presented. However, I aim to show there is a connection, and that the Egyptians left subtle clues in their art and writings. The study of the relationship between signs and symbols and what they represented has produced a wealth of information around the world and in Egypt specifically. However, some of the Egyptian hieroglyphs and symbols have not yet been authoritatively deciphered or explained. This series of 10 minute lectures aims to resolve the origin of these symbols and to determine their practical application in Egyptian life. The symbols in question are the Jed, the Crook, the Wasept, the Ankh, the Tet and finally the Flail. Now this investigation analysed the symbols used in predominantly two methods. The first method involved a system of reverse engineering as is generally used to reconstruct a device or component where written documentation has never existed. The second is empirical in character involving models specifically designed and constructed to test the hypothesis. These two approaches have rarely been combined to resolve this type of problem but by systematically developing working models and observing the results experiments can be formed, be performed which yield useful data and information and hopefully solve the mystery. The most common and recognisable symbol from ancient Egypt is the Jed, which I hypothesised to be a windlass or winch, and that the other symbols, the Ankh, Flail, Was and Crook, work in conjunction with it. To start, I feel it important to show you how I came to view the Jed as a windlass. This is a scene from the Temple of Seti I, from the west, from the west wall of the Osirian Hall. It shows the raising of the Jed pillar. It's my contention that there are in fact two types of jet for this reason. Two distinct bases are shown beneath each pillar. Now I know through experimentation that one type of base needs to be transportable and the sled positioned under the right pillar indicates this machine would be positioned on the pyramid. The other rests on the floor. Now this is a fixed jet or a static, static winch line. Some illustrations show the jet pillar portrayed with human arms holding the anchor and the flail. Some have suggested the jed represents fertility, but the more widely accepted view is that it represents a combination of strength, stability and balance. The jed was considered necessary to help protect and transform human flesh into the spiritual form assumed by the deceased in eternity, but in order to protect and transform flesh into the spiritual form, a pyramid is needed. The question arises, how can the jet protect and transform? I studied this picture for about three hours, and I eventually asked myself one simple question. Could the crook fit over the small protrusion at the top of the jet? Now this idea led me to imagine the column in three dimensions, like some type of round post. So the four crossbars would now look like three spools. So what would the Egyptians want with spools? The first thing that came to mind was rope spools. It was at this moment I viewed the jet as a type of tall capstan or windlass. Now for this reason, to operate a conventional capstan, long poles are inserted into holes over a wasted drum. Sailors would rotate the mechanism by walking around the capstan, pushing on the levers. Thus, in this case, the spooled ropes replace the levers. The video shows the concept in action. Pulling on the green tapes rotates the spools, and pulling on the yellow tape rewinds the green tape ready to repeat the process. So rotating the jet is now dependent on the amount of men pulling on the ropes. To satisfy my curiosity I decided to build a working model. To rotate the mechanism one would need some type of ball and socket arrangements underneath the flared base. As we've seen the jet is depicted standing on the square base. I can only assume this base is the outer casing of a socket. The entire model took about two weeks to construct. The model was ready and a date was set for the first experiment. Now I was attempting to lift 120 pounds up a 10 degree slope. Operating the jet is quite simple. The guy in the white coat balances the jet by hand. The person in the blue coat rewinds the mechanism by walking backwards. Now I tighten the tow rope against the base of the jet. It's now at the start of its first rotation. The workers pull on the ropes and the sled laden with bricks ascends. 
This first experiment indicated that Jed had a mechanical advantage of around 3.5, but this value is dependent on spool diameter when they are fully wound. This was the first in a long line of empirical tests, and perhaps the interpretation of the Jed was correct. It literally meant strength. Now it could be said, once the Egyptians knew the principles of a windlass and the limitations of its use, we could in theory reverse engineer the likelihood of any adaptation. To do so we must analyse each part of the windlass and extrapolate this adaptation. I know from experimentation that the jet becomes very unstable once a load reaches the same height as the pivot. It has the effect of upending a pivot and pulling a ball out of the socket. Instinctively the guys knew applying weight from above would in theory stabilise the machine. Now to prevent this instability in a practical way, one would place a fixed pivot above and below the mechanism. The concept I have in mind is to use the bedrock as a socket for the pivot base. Now the fixed pivot above would be a long heavy beam. Now granite beams of 40 tonnes or more can be found on top of the king's chamber. This is a photograph of the upper relieving chamber in the King's Chamber. Now this is known as Campbell's Chamber. This is the same photograph only viewed upside down. The beam hollow is round at one end and chamfered at the other. To me this is to facilitate the insertion of the jed. Now this is the concept I had in mind with the jed held in position. Feeling confident I commissioned an artist to, to illustrate the idea. However, on reflection, I did not realise the power ropes would rub on, rub on the underside of the crossbeam. I wondered, did the Egyptians leave any clues? I then came upon this artefact, a piece of wooden furniture from the Louvre, Paris. It depicts two symbols of nuts of papyrus heads flanked by jed pillars. In both scenes there are three pairs of enclosed pillars, held in position by a crossbeam. Now ancient Egyptian artists avoided single perspective and adopted a set of rules to determine aspect and proportions. Known as aspective, it controls the angle of view and the size of each part in relation to the whole. Now according to Gay Robbins in her book The Art of Ancient Egypt, I quote from page 21, when creating representations on a two-dimensional surface, the Egyptians did not aim to incorporate the appearance of depth Rather, they arranged two-dimensional Im images of the object they wished to represent over the flat-drawn surface. These objects were then rendered according to the most characteristic and easily recognisable aspect, usually in profile, full view, plan or elevation. These were then grouped together to form a scene. Because these different views can occur together in the same picture plane, the result is not rendered as from a single viewpoint but rather as a composite assemblage encoding information that can be interpreted by the educated viewer. I asked myself, could this be a schematic drawing? Modern architects use different elevations of use to explain a concept, so perhaps the ancient Egyptians did the same. If so, the upper register depicts the left and right view of the pyramid, with the mission jets positioned either side. To me, this reduction in height represents distance, and they are powered with papyrus rope. The register below is a close-up F front and S side view of a schematic with three pairs of windlasses. Now the support column F caught my attention again. I asked why is there a small hole above the groove in the wood? In fact why is there a slit in the wood at all? And then for the second time the penny dropped. The columns F1 and two are joined together to support a crossbeam. Now remember this is an aspective view where the front and side view are shown in the same picture plane. In a perspective view columns one and two would look like this joined together to support the crossbeam three. The holes in the top of the columns are used to guide the ropes on and off the spools. The vertical slits in the wood allow the tow rope to pass through the support column and force the jet in its pivot. So you can see why the artist used these different views to explain the concept. And this is the ball and socket arrangement beneath the jet. The jet is used to haul construction blocks from the quarry towards the base of the pyramid. Now to fully understand how it all works, I've made this film clip.